Well, I hope that was exciting for you guys as it was for me. I've had a crush on Megan Smith forever, but please don't tell her. I'm sure she can't hear me now. We're going to keep it moving along because that one went a bit over. So uh, please welcome to the stage Morgan Debon from Blavity and Megan Rose Dickey. Hey, Morgan, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So the stats are pretty harrowing. Between 2012 and 2014, um, the amount of venture funding that went to black women was less than 1%. So I'm really excited to be talking to you today. I think that you're a true unicorn in the tech industry, a black female startup founder and CEO. So tell me about the last time you tried to come to Disrupt? <laughs> yeah, great, great question. So two years ago, so Lavity's two years old, um, or about you know, two, two and some change. And so when we were first started Blavity, I applied to get a scholarship to come to TechCrunch Disrupt, and I was declined. So I'm excited to be here for the first time to be on stage. Yeah, does it? <laughs> yeah, give her a round of applause for sure. And let's, let's talk about visibility. How important is it that you're up here right now on stage as a black female startup founder? Yeah, I mean, I think being visible is, you know, part of any startup life, right? You want to get press. You want people to know what you're working on. Um, if you want to be a thought leader, you want to be seen. And I think for Blavity specifically, because part of what we do is educate and inform as a media company, it's important that people know who I am and they know uh, what we're working on. And I think, you know, thinking about diversity in general and startup diversity when like a lot of my DMs and messages from people, they're inspired by seeing an all black startup team and seeing a black founding team um, and me as a black female CEO. So yeah, I think it means a lot. Definitely. I'm going to keep talking about how you're black just for a little bit longer, then we'll move on. <laughs> um, so you recently, um, well, actually, you're on the verge of closing a pretty significant seed round. What was that experience like for you? Yeah, it's been a journey. You know, media is is hot and also not hot at the same time. Right. Um, so when I first raised our pre-seed, uh, it was tough. I started and realized that I wasn't ready. Like I wasn't emotionally ready to go through that mental process of putting myself out there every day. You know, 20 mm -hmm. meetings a week. Um, and so we stopped and really made sure that our metrics were aggressively like overachieving for the stage that we were in. So, you know, we had almost a million monthly unique visitors um, with no funding. And so once we got to that stage, um, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to find partners and investors that really aligned with our mission, um, brought some really great people on board, like the Knight Foundation, mm -hmm. New Media Ventures, Macro Ventures. Um, and now as we go into our seed round, you know, looking for a lot more strategic partners. And um, yeah, it, it's been an interesting run. I just finished 500 startups right. as well, the last batch, uh, which was helpful. What do you look for in investors, especially in terms of remaining authentic to the black community? Yeah, I look for people who get it, right? Like you can tell in the first like five minutes of a conversation with an investor if they understand and uh, agree with this kind of premise that Blavity is built on, which is that black people influence culture, um, that they're underrepresented in tech and consumer tech products, and therefore we have a blue ocean opportunity to really build something interesting for an audience that is incredibly influential in our culture. So you mentioned black people are underrepresented in the tech industry um, across startups and big tech companies, and probably even more so, if not comparable, in the venture capital industry. Do you have any black investors? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Charles King, Macro okay. Ventures, absolutely. That's part of you know um, how we have designed our team, and that includes our advisors to make sure that it's reflective of, of what we care about. Nice. You've previously mentioned that you do receive some criticism even from the black community. What is that about? 
Yeah, you know, I think because we are so visible, you know, Blavity is a media company, right? So it's our job constantly to be creating content and pushing things out there. Um, we also have a user-generated content platform, so a lot of our content is submitted from our user base, and so not everything that goes up is going to be completely aligned um, with me personally or with other people in the community, and so there's conflict. Uh, there was an article that happened this summer, and we started trending on Twitter because people were upset that the article. Uh, Which article was it? Uh, it was about hidden colors. Uh, it was about uh, a Netflix documentary, and the, the guy behind it, uh, a lot of people don't agree with his personal statements about what. Okay. Yeah. So it was tough. It was a tough day. <laughs> and how did you handle that? Um, I listened to what people were saying. Um, we talked to the writer. Uh, ultimately decided to take the article down, and okay. then uh, I explained you know, why, what our process was, and a little bit more about Blavity as a whole, because we are a media company and we do have user-generated content, there will be things that aren't always aligned. Was that the first time something like that had happened, where you, you took down an article based on the feedback from the community? It was, yeah. It was a tough, like, editorial decision. Right. Yeah. Do, you, do you envision that you might have to do things like that in the future? Or what's your process around that? Um, you know, I'm sure we will. Like, you know, we make so much content every day. Uh, and as we grow, we'll continue to put out a ton of content every day. So you know, I think, I think it's really about having a strong editorial team and having community guidelines about what's OK and what's not OK. And so if something is flagged, uh, it's not a surprise. Right. Blavity is all about creating relevant content for black millennials. How do you determine what's relevant to them or to us, to me? <laughs> right. Um, that's a great question. You know, I think it's really about listening to what people are saying and then enabling them to actually speak for themselves. So for example, um, a lot of our writers are from all over the country. They're remote. Um, they can write on any frequency. Anyone at this point um, can sign up for an account. That's a new thing we just launched today. Um, which enables anyone to create content and put it up on Blavity. And so that helps us stay relevant, where it's not just what's happening in the newsroom that morning. Um, you know, so we'll move towards our editorial team doing a lot of the high quality pieces of content um, and that you can't necessarily just write off you know, the spiff. You need research, and it needs to be like validated, et cetera. And then um, the majority of the content that you see will ideally be from our users and will be relevant. Okay. What percentage of your content is from full-time staffers versus user-generated? It's about 40% is our editorial staff. OK, got it. So also, just in terms of relevance, what, what have you found is relevant to black millennials? Are you, yeah. I wonder if you, are you just trolling black Twitter, or <laughs> what, what have you found? Well, black Twitter is amazing, so I think you know, our content ranges from essays, a lot of thought pieces and reactions to what's going on. So if Beyonce comes out with an amazing album, Lemonade, get a lot of it. essays um, about everything, and, and all the way to serious topics. So for right. example, um, one of our community members was a uh, law student at Harvard, and they woke up one morning and saw a tape on all the black law professors' uh, faces. And so instead of, you know, reporting that to CNN or New York Times, and then someone coming and reporting on it, she actually decided to write an essay and put it up on the site. And that's you know, how the story got out to the entire country. Right. And a lot of, a lot of the, or maybe not a lot of the content, but if, if someone goes to blavity.com, they're, depending on the day or what's happening in the world, they might see some content about um, police shootings of unarmed black people. Yep. What's your editorial strategy around that kind of, around those kind of really terrible events? Yeah, I mean, those are rough days. Um, and I think usually what we try to do is find people on the ground in that city who are participating as activists, protesters, uh, and we try to give them the tools so that they can tell the story from their perspective. Um, we spend a lot of time working closely with different activists in okay. um, Netta, Dre, et cetera, right. and making sure that we're supporting and that we can help distribute messages that need to get out. In the event that there's a video associated with the shooting yeah. or murder, do you run those videos? 
We used to. Uh, we've stopped. So we usually do some sort of trigger warning and then leak out to the video. Okay. I think as a community, uh, and a black community as a whole, um, you know, I, I don't think it's helpful anymore. You know, I think we know, we know what it looks like. We don't need to see it again and again. Yeah, I know. I personally, I actively avoid those videos. I yeah. just know that I can't emotionally handle that, um, that sort of thing. Um, although Blavity aims to reach black millennials, I'm, or I know of some people who are white who read the site. Yeah. Um, my boss, I won't mention his name right now, but um, <laughs> he loves it. He absolutely loves it. What do you want white readers to get out of Blavity? You know, I think that Blavity's mission is to portray and to create an opportunity for the diversity of black diaspora and, and energy and creativity to shine and uh, to put the power back into our hands to decide what we want to talk about and how we want to talk about things. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, my hope with anyone that's engaging with the platform is that they're open to perhaps changing their perception of what, of what the black world and black interests and black news and black creativity looks like. Um, I get a lot of emails. We have a daily email that goes out kind of yeah, like the scam. I receive it. Love it. Right. <laughs> Super funny. You guys should all sign up. Um, and so I get, it's an automated email once you sign up for me that's like, hey, welcome, you know, typical startup thing. Right. Um, but most people don't know that it's automated, so they respond. Okay. Um, and I get a lot of, like, white women in, like, Kansas City who are like, hey, am I allowed to be here? I've got, like, a black child or a grandchild or I'm yeah. a teacher. And I think it's fantastic. I mean, those, those are great emails. To, to receive and kind of, I think, speak to the power that black culture is mainstream culture and it is accessible um, and that, you know, blavity is something for everybody. Right. So I imagine then the white woman from Tennessee, you told her that, yes, you, you are allowed to read this site. Absolutely. I'm like, glad you're here. What's up? Right. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you mentioned earlier that uh, today you've actually launched a new version of blavity. What's What's so special about this version? Yeah, so Blavity was originally on WordPress. Um, and what we've seen in the last few years is that the Blavity audience likes, comments, and shares about four times more than the average user online. Hmm. Um, and not only that, they like to talk to each other. So our comment section is just like ridiculous. It's like essays on essays. Is it so productive? Funny. All productive. OK, controls. that is not my experience here. A <laughs> crunch. Um, yeah, you know, I think. I think that we've created this really cool space where people feel comfortable and they feel like it's an invitation to have a discussion. And so we wanted to take that a step forward and build a platform that allowed people to do that uh, better. And then also, you know, most of our users are actually on a mobile device. About 80% of them are visiting us on a, on a mobile uh, web version of the site. And so we needed to update it so that it was a cleaner, smarter version on mobile. And then um, also enabling people to create content themselves and not have to go through our editorial team to get up on the site. Right. And you mentioned on our prep call that you, you felt like you needed to first launch a media platform before even really touching tech and building your own platform. Why is that? Uh, to be honest, Megan, I thought that, um, and I think it's true, I think that I had to be exceptional before someone was going to take a risk from an investment perspective to say, OK, they want to build this like mega platform, um, social network, media company hybrid. Um, and I knew that, and I'm a non-technical CEO. I've got a CTO, Jeff, um, and other co-founders who are fantastic. But we needed to show that we could build a really large audience that was incredibly engaged, um, you know, I think, to be able to tell a compelling investment story. Got it. And also, as part um, as part of the company, or your, you know, what's happening in the last in in the next couple of months, you are launching AfroTech. Yes. And um, I will actually be there at that conference. What should I expect? How will it be different from Disrupt? Yeah, so uh, part of Blavity's kind of community building strategy is events. A lot of media companies have, have kind of had this, this strategy of creating conferences. Mm -hmm. uh, we did one last spring called Empower Her, which was for black millennial women influencers. 
Um, and it was fantastic, sold out, it was in New York. And so as we think about how we want to move forward and kind of build these subcultures and communities, I think the technology and startup space is growing quickly mm -hmm. in the black community. And there weren't any um, real moments where we could all come together, right? There are some fantastic startup CEOs. Um, there's some fantastic venture capitalists that are rising, raising their own funds, raising black funds, black and Latino funds. Um, and so we wanted to create a space where they had a platform and we could leverage Blavity's distribution, you know, the energy of San Francisco, um, and kind of create this really cool experience. So what you could expect is um, discussions, fireside chats about um, success and tips that people have used to get to where they are. So we will not have any diversity in tech panels. Uh, but you will we, not have any. We will not, no. Uh, we, will, we will talk about you know, tangible tips and, and tools to get to the next level. OK, nice. And we, we talked about this a bit before, but so you're, you're about to close um, a seed round. About how much money are you thinking you'll? Yeah, so our, our total amount raised will be over a million. OK. Um, and yeah, we're super excited. That'll be to fund more engineers to build out the platform um, and also to make more video content. OK, great. Yeah, Blavity has really great video content. I'm, I've been really impressed with it. Um, so in, in terms of. In terms of the future of Blavity, you know, you've launched this new version of the site. Uh, you're having these tech conferences. You're doing original video. What else do you envision for the company? Yeah. So I think as we grow, um, we're going to learn a lot more about how black millennials specifically engage online. And that's going to give us access to a lot of data. And um, you know, we're, we're basing the company off of this premise that black people influence culture. And so if I can get you know, a large enough of population of people engaging with Blavity content across our ecosystem, whether that's the web, mobile, in real life, uh, we can create some interesting insights about what might be happening, um, what are the things that people are talking about, what's the pulse of the culture, which will allow us, I think, to, to kind of create a, a compelling marketing and content story in the future. Blavity reaches about 7 million millennials a month. Yeah. What does that mean exactly? Like, where are you reaching them? On the website, right. on social media, or where? So we exactly? reach about a million people on the website a month, yeah. unique visitors. Um, and then we have five Instagram accounts, uh, three Twitter accounts, Facebook page. And so those are actually unique engagements of, of users. So our total reach is around 30 to 40 million okay. um, on any given month. And then you know, uniques are around 7 million people reached. Okay. And I know that you have a, a good number of partnerships. Like, I, I believe Google is, is a partner. Not of yours. Google. No. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more about partners. Not yet. <laughs> well, who are your partners? Yeah, so we have, um, we have content partners, right? So we've right. worked with Teen Vogue. Um, we've worked with uh, Change.org. And those content partnerships are usually around what's an interesting demographic that may not be, may not have access to Blavity's content, uh, and maybe looking for an authentic voice, a black voice to, for their audience. So for Teen Vogue, we'll do article swaps um, and engage there. And yeah, we've worked with the White House on different things. Um, what have you done with the White House specifically? Um, so whenever they're doing like black specific um, announcements, we'll make sure that we have access to that. When Obama pardoned um, a bunch of, of, of prisoners this summer, you know, we had uh, the original statements and thank you letters from some of them that were released on the site. Mm -hmm. Got it. So in your, in your experience with Blavity, what's been, what's been the hardest challenge? Um, You've gone from yeah. bootstrap to now being funded by institutional investors. And I think the hardest challenge has been building in public. You know, it's it's a it's a very intimate company, right? It's a right. It, we're building something that is a direct reflection of problems that I face, that my team faces, that you face, that our audience faces, and so there's a lot of emotions in everything that we do, everything that we create. Um, it's a beautiful thing because that's why we've grown so quickly. 
right? Um, but I think it, it also is very difficult because I open myself up to criticism anytime right. we release anything. Um, right. it, and, and people can come up with some very valid arguments. And I think it's made us stronger. You know, I think it's made us more resilient. Um, and it's personally made myself more resilient, I think, to, and open to, to feedback. But it's, it's tough sometimes. Right, yeah. And Blavity covers a lot of heavy topics. How do you ensure or foster the emotional stability of yourself and yeah. your, uh, your writers? Yeah, I think like self-care and being really flexible so people can work from home. If something's happening, we'll say, you know, you're welcome to work from home, just check in uh, if you don't feel like coming in today. I think personally, I have amazing co-founders. I know my co-founders, we all went to college together, so I've known them for mm -hmm. six, seven plus years. Some of them are in the crowd. Um, and so if there's days when I'm like, I just can't deal with it today, you know, right, right now, I'll call them, you know, and, and we support each other that way. But I think for any, any startup CEO going through this process, it is emotionally draining and it is really right. difficult. So you have to be proactive in taking care of yourself. Nice. Well, I appreciate your work and I'm looking forward to the AfroTech conference in November. Yep. I will be there. Thanks Thank so much. You. Thanks for having me. Yep.